Thank you so, thank you so much, Lori, for that uh, uh, reminder of Abraham. And as as you know, we're going through this series called Covenant and Commandments. And as we go through this series of Covenant and Commandment, there is something that you and I have been learning. A covenant is an agreement establishing relationship with life or death consequences. And you and I, for those of you who are married, now hands up if you are married. And if you are married, you have an everlasting, until your life ends, uh, example of a covenant, right? You got married through a covenant. So a covenant is an agreement establishing relationship that gives us an opportunity to realize and understand God's covenants now that we're going through. And this is week three of our whole entire covenant series. Week three where we're learning that these covenants are actually intertwined, actually telling us the theme of the whole entire Bible, actually showing us of the story of God's redemption of his creation through his son Jesus. And this son, right at these early on the covenants, are the seed. It's the seed. Now, seed is plural or many, and that promise of the seed was promised to Eve, as you and I remember, right? Eve was promised a seed that would do what? That would crush who? And through this seed, when Adam and Eve has their first son and their third son, they named that son after that promise. Did you know that? Cain's name, God has helped me give birth to a son, to a seed. And Seth's name is God has helped me produce a seed. It's part of this whole entire story of seed. And, and you and I know that the first three covenants, the covenant that God gave in the Garden of Eden, which is fill the earth, rule, and reign along. That's the promise in the Garden of Eden. And the promise that he gave to Adam, which is the three curses to the serpent, Eve, and Adam himself. We can go ahead and, and summarize them into one big idea. God's promise of redemption for his creation must come through people who are faithful to him. And if you read through Genesis, it is not a boring story of just names. It's the story of how the seed, the promise that God gave, is working throughout the whole entirety of Genesis. Genesis is telling us, this is how you should follow the story. And here, you and I know the story of the seed. Adam and Eve, right? And it's not their first son, Cain, or their second son, Abel. It's their third son, Seth. Now, last week, you and I found the name, Seth, all the way to Noah. And you can turn to Genesis chapter 5 to actually go ahead and see that particular uh, names of the seed being passed down. Now, Noah, last week, we just briefly learned about him, but he has three sons, right? Japheth, Ham, and Shem. And if you turn your Bibles and you have some in front of you to go to Genesis chapter 10, you will exactly find, friends, at this time, that there are now divisions of languages and divisions of people. They could find their ancestry towards Japheth, Ham, or Shem. And at every single division, when Japheth's family line is mentioned, it says at the very bottom, and they have their own language. And it goes on to Ham, and the very same thing. And it goes on to Shem, and the very same thing. Languages are now being established here in Noah's three sons. And as the, the earth became populated, something happened with the seed. The seed story passed on. And we hear about Noah's descendants in Genesis chapter 10. We have Noah, then Shem, then Arphaxad, then Shelah, then Eber, and then there's Peleg. Now, friends, I'm excited when we look at names. Because names have meaning. Anybody know the, name, the, mean, the meaning of your names? My name is Ravi. The name, the meaning of my name is Bright. I pass that name on to my son, Milton Atticus Bright. I love the meaning of names. My dad's name, Renee, means famous. My mom's name, Estelita, means uh, uh, Esther in English, star. Famous, star, bright. There's a wonderful connection when it comes to names. And here we stop at the word name Peleg. And Peleg's name is division. That's what his name means. 
divided, division. And friends, at that time, there's a, a, a wonderful story when it comes to Genesis. Uh, the writer of Genesis will tell us a summary first at the very beginning. And if he tells us a summary first in the very beginning, then he tells us the whole entire story after. After. It just so happens, if you read through your Bible, there's a, an aside commentary, Peleg, which means division. And there's a little bit more information, and that's pointing to something that you and I know very well, a story that we might have been taught when we were younger, uh, something about a tower. Do you recall that story? What's a tower called? Babel. The Tower of Babel story. And friends, Peleg's name is deeply connected with the Tower of Babel. And we're following the seed, we stop to think about the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Now many people think, just reading through the story, that it's just something of a story of humanity's downfall again against God. Friends, it is more than that. It is more than that. If we examine the Tower of Babel, we'll find something that humanity does towards God. Here, there are now divisions of different languages, but a long time ago they spoke one common language. And with that common language, they began to talk with one another and say some things. You know what they, what they said? Let us build a tower that reaches to the heavens. My friends, there is something very important when humanity said those things. First off, when Noah built the ark, what did he use to make it waterproof? Tar. Friends, read slowly the Tower of Babel story. When humanity began to build this tower all together, what do you think they were trying to do? Make it waterproof. They use the exact same material in the ark as they're doing in this Tower of Babel. Now, what did God promise Noah to never ever do again with the rainbow as his agreement, as his covenant? What was it again? Not to flood the earth. So what do you think is humanity's action here when they're building the tower and making it waterproof? Do they believe the promise? No. They don't believe that God is going to flood, uh, not flood the earth again. But they've seen the rainbow many times, and they've heard from their ancestors many times that that's the case. But here they're going, no, let's build a tower that's waterproof. Also, they also rejected God's command to fill the earth. Instead of them uh, filling the earth, they decided to go ahead and meet in one central location to build this tower. So that's two things now that they're just trusting God with. The last thing is when they said, let's go ahead and reach the heavens. Friends, when they said that, they're actually saying, we are better than we are better than God. Do you see in the Tower of Babel story, that's a rejection of God's command. That's a rejection of God's blessings. That's a rejection of God's promises. And friends, the full rebellion against God leads to God dividing and then causing his promise for them to fill the earth through that division. And friends, that's Peleg's name. That's how we know his name. And it continues on. So from Peleg, we have Ru. From, Sir, uh, from Ru, we have Sarug. Then Nahor. Then Terah. And then finally, we have something, a name that looks familiar that uh, uh, Lori was talking about with our family element a while ago. Abram. The story of Abram. Now, friends, as the people, as humanity, were spreading throughout the whole entire world at that time, now with their different languages, and now they have difficulty to communicating, they, because of their rejection of who God is, guess what they started to make? Different gods. And they started worshiping different gods. Multiple gods. Gods that they make themselves, 
or the stars that God created, or the moon that God created, or this image that they created. They started to worship them over and over. And this is a far cry now from Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, where the writer of Genesis tells us, which is Moses, by the way, telling us that all people worshiped God. But through all these covenants, humanity continues to break their own covenant by no longer worshiping God. And at a long time ago, when I was younger, I thought that God just called Abraham, and then all off they went with that promise. But as you read through God's words, you realize there's a lot of backstory that needs, uh, that needs to be said and, and when it comes to Abraham. Did you know that his family worshipped multiple gods? That's how he started off as. But his father, Terah, and himself were called out by God to stop worshipping those multiple gods and go and worship him. Take a look at what Joshua says to the Israelites in Joshua chapter 24, verses 2 to 3. I'm going to read it to you. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. So friends, we have this background of Abraham and Terah worshiping other gods. And if you turn to Genesis chapter 11, you'll find that Terah was actually called away from worshiping other gods into worshiping God. Let's read it together. Genesis chapter 11, verse 30. 31 to 32. One day, Terah took his son Abraham, his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his grandson Lot, and moved away from the Ur of Chaldeans. They were moving away from the Ur of Chaldeans. Where? Well, if you look at Joshua, God's calling them to go somewhere. Both Terah and Abraham. So here they are, moving towards somewhere uh, where God's calling them to. However, Terah settled at Haran. Terah didn't go all the way to the land that God called him to. Terah went on a journey and stopped at Haran, halfway obedient towards God. Terah there lived for 205 years and died while he was still in Haran. While he was trying to make up his mind to go ahead and listen to God, he died in halfway obedience. So if you look at Genesis chapter 12, which is our main passage this morning, you then find the story of the covenant that God gives to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. And God established this covenant with Abraham that will become and is today still a blessing to all peoples. A blessing to all people. Take a look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Read along with me. The Lord had said to Abraham, the Abram, because Terah now died, right? So Abraham now is called, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Go to the land I will show you. Now, let's just be honest, church and friends. If somebody asks you to go, will you go? Leave your family and your friends. Leave the comforts of your home. Leave it all behind and go to this land that you're going to be shown. And here you see the very first promise of God towards Abraham. If Abraham goes, he'll receive land. Oh, that would be nice, right, in today's climate? Anybody here own land? Oh, I would love to own land, right? But here's God telling Abram, You will get land if you go. Look what he says next. Look at these promises. God makes, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. So not only does he promise land, he's promising Abraham a nation, a famous name, and for him 
to become a blessing for others. And then he says, protection, a promise of protection. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And then the greatest promise of them all, friends, family, and church, all families on earth will be blessed through Abraham. What a wonderful promise. And this is a covenant. God says to, to Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you nation. I'm going to make your name famous. But I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless others through you. I'm going to bless all peoples on earth through you. And the command that Abraham just has to follow is go. Leave now and I will show you the land. But that word go, friends, is more than just go. It's obey. It's follow his direction. It's obey in faithfulness. It's not just go and then God's going to give it to you. It's, it's go and you obey him. You worship him. Now think about the, the, the travels that Abraham is going. He was in the Ur of Chaldeans where they were worshiping how many gods? Multiple gods. Then he made a journey through and his father stopped halfway. But he went all the way and says, no, not my gods, my God. And because of his action, God's going to do something when it comes to his faithfulness. Friends, the relationship between God and Abraham in this particular covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, is this. God tested and tried Abraham's faithfulness to make sure that it was made true. Do you know why? Think of all the previous covenants. Right? Have they been broken? By God? No. By humanity? Yes. So now God's going to make sure that Abraham is not just going, but he's full obedience and he has his faithfulness. And oh, friends, was he ever tested? You know he's not perfect? Did you know that Abraham lied twice to cover his butt from getting destroyed? And even though in that, God still blessed him and protected him in those two times, you can read them. He's not perfect. But what Abraham does is that he was tested. He was promised a nation, right? How many kids did Abraham have at that point? Zero. How can you have a nation when you got no kids? Many times in the story of Genesis, they point out who's barren? Who's barrenness? Sarah. Sarah can't have any kids. And how many years did they have to wait from Abraham seeing the land to having Sarah see his own, her own child. Long time. Right? Lori Walgo asked, how old is too old to have kids? How old was Sarah when she had kids? A kid. How long was that? That was a test of faithfulness, friends. Here's another test of faithfulness. Another test of faithfulness is, uh, well, God said, ask, Mo, uh, ask Abraham one day, Okay, I will confirm my covenant with you. That's in Genesis chapter 17. But then uh, uh, he asked Abraham to do something. The mark of circumcision. It's a hard thing to do, right? Uh, being Filipino, it is a rite of passage to be circumcised. When I was 13 years old, as part of my village tradition, I had to be. Uh, when I am circumcised, I become a man. That's part of the rites of passage. Back then in Genesis 17, that was a sign to Abraham that he has a personal covenant with God. Not only did Abraham have to do it, his whole entire household and servants have to do it. As a sign of this covenant. That's the test to see if he would. Now friends, my, 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 my mom and dad uh, made a joke with me because uh, I have two Two sons, they're awesome and they're wonderful, and they look like me and they also act like me in stubbornness. 
And we circumcised them when they were younger because I'm like, I'm not, they're not going through that stuff when they're older. No, it's too painful, okay? And so my, my dad and my mom now have a joke. They call our sons, as part of the rites of passage, men, right? And they're not there yet. I'm just telling you how circumcision works in my culture and in my village. But circumcision, when it comes to Abraham and God, that was a sign of the covenant that he was making. But there is one more test that Abraham had to do. Do you remember what it was? So he was given his son Isaac. Oh, what a wonderful, glorious time. He praised God for it because now the nation is going to come through Isaac. But then what did God ask Abraham to do with Isaac? Sacrifice. You can read that in Genesis chapter 22. Did Abraham go through with it? He was willing, right? I see that some of you are parents this morning. Are you, would you be willing to let go of one of your sons? And isn't it amazing the parallelism between what God's going to do through the seed that he promised and eventually to Christ, to what he's asking Abraham to do. The promise that he's given to him, his son Isaac, it's through him that's what's going to happen. And yet here he is going to go ahead and sacrifice his son. And as he was about to go through with it, I'm going to read to you what happens next. Found in Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 to 18. The Bible says, This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed and have not withheld your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sands in the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants, all nations of all the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Friends, the result of this relationship and this covenant is now that because of Abraham's obedience and faithfulness, it's through him that God's promises are carried out. Now, friends, this is important. Because of Abraham's faithfulness, God makes a promise of a nation that he will use to bless people with. A nation that may not like him. A nation that might disobey him, yet he still gave a promise. So you want to put a pin on this because it's important. Because in future uh, messages in this series, you and I are going to discover just how good the Israelites are to God. And he points back to Abraham's faithfulness. The reason why he is going to use them still is because of Abraham's faithfulness. God chose Abraham because of his faithfulness. And friends, that's the measurement of this covenant. Abraham's faithfulness. Was he tried? Yes. Was he tested? Yes. Was his faithfulness made true? Yes. And the result is that he eventually will get the land. He won't, but his descendants will. His name is quite famous, right? We had a song about it. Father Abraham had many children. When I was in the Philippines, they taught me that in VBS. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons as Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, right? That's the song that I, I, I learned. And his name is famous. And friends, the three biggest religions in our world today, Muslim, Christ, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, find their faith in who? Whose name? Abraham. Abraham's name is famous. And he was blessed by God. And yes, we're going to learn about how he will use Abraham and his descendants to bless all People. But what is the connection to Jesus? That's the story of the seed. Started in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. 
And now we're following the story of the seed, and the story of the seed goes all the way from Abraham's faith to Abraham's sons, and all the way to Jesus, who becomes a blessing to all. And you can read about how that works in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 3. The genealogy of Jesus, whose names have meaning, points back to this covenant of Abraham. Friends, it also tells us God's wonderful faithfulness to you and to me. So many people in our world today are crying out, where is God? Why isn't he doing anything? We're, injustices are happening today in our world. This or that is going on. Where is God? And where can we find that answer? God made a promise that those who believe Jesus Christ will have forgiveness. That's a promise to humanity, yes. But it's a promise to all creation. Because it is through Jesus that justice is going to be served. It might not be here in our lifetime. But through Jesus, that will happen. All we need to do is to be faithful towards who God is. Friends, and that's what we should do. Many times when I go visit people, not only Christians, but also non-Christians, and I hang out with them, they all have a question. How do I get closer to God? Anybody want to be closer to God? Friends, I have some good news for you, and also some news that you need to deal with and struggle with. If you want to be closer to God, your obedience to Him will be refined. You'll be given many opportunities to go ahead and obey him. Because he will refine it. He will try your faithfulness. He will test it. Because he wants it to be true. Because many people in our world today who consider themselves Christians just come. But your faithfulness has to be included. We've talked about this. You can't be like the people of the Ur of Chaldeans who are worshiping multiple gods and also worship God. That doesn't work. You can't be Terah who's halfway obedience and said, you know what, I'm going to halfway obey you, God. No, that doesn't work. You got to be like Abraham. And you got to go all the way and obey and be faithful to God. That's what we should do. So if you want to draw closer to God, Start worshiping God more. Remember what Jesus says when he was asked what two commandments, what commandment is the greatest thing ever? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is our God, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what faithfulness looks like. And then to love others as much as you love yourself. Friends, those two commandments are really good. But you know what's, what's crazy about this whole entire covenant? Is that a long time ago, God promised Abraham that through him, all peoples will be blessed. If you have accepted, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been blessed through Abraham. Not only that, because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are now God's people. And friends, as God's people, we carry something everywhere we go. We carry the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. We have to start thinking like that, church. We are carriers of God's blessing to all people wherever we go. So friends, here's a challenge for you. You want to bless your friends? Share them the story of Jesus Christ. You really want to bless them and you want them to succeed in life and have a wonderful future like you have? Share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. We are carriers. Maybe there's some of you this morning who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. It is this. I know from experience that I've done so many things wrong. I know I have rebelled against God and I have sinned against Him. But the invitation of the good news tells me that those don't matter. So long as I realize what God has done for me through Christ, 
And because of what he's done for me through Christ, I surrender this life. I say, you know what? This is what I am right here in the Ur of Chaldeans of my sin. I am not Terah going halfway. I am like Abraham. I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to give my life to God. When I gave my life to God, something changed in my life. God started to refine this guy. Right? And you can talk to my wife about it. There's a lot of things that God works in my life. I used to be very, very angry. Now I'm not so angry. You know? I used to yell at people. And I, I'm going to share this because there's newer people uh, that are visiting with us. I always share stories about my life. I used to follow people when they cut me off. Home. I follow them home. I don't do that anymore. And that's, that's the, uh, there's a lot of anger issues I have. And God's refining that. But also, he's working on my heart. I used to walk past people who need help. I, I, can't, I can't now without breaking apart. I used to struggle through the fact that, uh, I, well, this person says they need this help and that help. I used to struggle going, but now I don't. See, this is a process, and here's the good news. I know I'm not perfect. All religions in the world, except for one, says, I have to earn my salvation. Christianity says, I don't have to. God's grace is given to me, and I follow with my faithfulness, my obedience. Do I get it right? No. Am I 100% correct all the time? No. But my faithfulness in realizing that God has forgiven me through Christ is what keeps me focused. Because I know somewhere down the road, somebody else is going to cut me off. And I'm probably going to lose my cool. I know. But a wonderful God, though, who gives me new mercies every day. Because of the faithfulness, not only because of the faithfulness, but because of his mercy and his grace, but because of his faithfulness and not mine. I want to invite you to the good news of Jesus Christ. If you haven't heard it yet, maybe it's time for you to hear it. And I'd like to share it with you through a meal or inviting you over to our house. So after the service today, if that's something that you want to do, you want to hear the good news and let's talk about it, please come up here after the service when you and I can talk. But, if you think that you are now ready to be fully faithful in Christ, then I ask you, friends, look towards Abraham and his faithfulness. Father, thank you for the covenant that you've given to Abraham, that through him you bless all peoples. Now, Father, I am just so thankful that because of that wonderful covenant that you've given him, I get to be blessed too. If I share it with others and they accept it, they also get to be blessed. Thank you, Lord, for being so faithful. Now challenge us as a church and use us. May we go ahead and share that blessing towards others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every week in our church, uh, if you haven't done yet, there are packages of communion packages at the back. We take communion together as a church, as instructed, as we've seen from the early church in the book of Acts and in other churches in the letter of the epistles. We follow their example. This is the new covenant. This is the covenant that you and I celebrate weekly. And it is part of who we are. And as we take it, we have to remember some things that are very important. As we take the communion, we have to remind ourselves that God promises are always true. We have to remind ourselves that his promises are never broken. And we have to remind ourselves that God's promises reveals his redemption story. This package is part of us in the redemption story of who we are as followers of Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together and remember Christ.
The Apostle Paul continues in the same way. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whether you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's go ahead and let's pray. Father, thank you for Christ, for the new covenant in him, for the forgiveness of our sins. And we remember that your words are never broken, your promises are true, and you have shown us your redemptive story of your creation through what you have done in Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen.